So you cannot buy video cards, you cannot buy some processors. Let's take a closer look at what you're not going to be able to buy next. On the 27th of January, Asus will be releasing its full lineup of Z590 powered motherboards. And that is not even a year since the release of its previous version, the Z490 motherboard. So what exactly can an engineering team do in less than a year? Well, quite a lot apparently. So today we will be previewing the ROG Strix Z590e, the gaming gold standard, a board which has more past and history than a French man stuck in Rotterdam overnight. And no, I will not be addressing that last point. Now, this year launch is especially important for Intel since they are releasing their very first PCIe 4.0 enabled processor and equally important for Asus because Strix is about the most scrutinized and wanted thought after gaming motherboard of its entire lineup. So in short, this preview for me at least is a big deal and obviously I still have I still do not have all of the details and specifics of this board, but enough for us to have a good idea of what's going to hopefully hit the shelf and our builds later on this month. Now, starting with the obvious. We are dealing with a 6 PCB layer ATX motherboard, which was fully expected uh, knowing that this is a PCIe 4.0 enabled board. Having that many layers ensures a perfect PCIe 4.0 signal isolation and a better VRM thermal diffusion. CPU socket wise, we got an LGA 1200 CPU socket, which will support both 10th and 11th generation of Intel Core CPU. Worth noting, only the incoming 11th gen processor is PCIe 4.0 enabled, which has its importance since it will be feeding double the bandwidth that the PCI 3.0 can to the most performance centric components of your build. VRM wise, well, that is by far the most impressive upgrade I've seen in a very long time. And I hope you are well strapped on your chair because we have 1670 amps power stages for a total of 1120 amps organized in eight parallel phases, seven of which are CPU centric. Now, some of you might ask, and rightfully so, why would we need that much power? Uh, to, to, to feed an 8-core processor? The short answer is thermals and huh, marketing. Obviously, half that power would have been enough to uh, uh, operate and even overclock the most demanding 11th or 11th generation of Intel Core processor, but using a fraction of 70 amps doesn't hit the same way as using all of the power of a 50 amps power stages. In short, it stays much cooler, much longer. In addition, the overall power draw is shared amongst 12 power stages, in effect spreading the heat all around it. The result should give us one of the coolest VRN, VRM seen to date. Add to that some massive looking heat pipe connected double contact design heat sinks, and you can expect to see a heck of a durable and performant motherboard altogether. Chipset wise, the Strix Z590e Gaming comes with, well, a Z590 Intel chipset, which is not very different than its Z490 or even Z390 predecessors. The few noticeable difference are an upgraded DMI link with the CPU going from four gigabyte per second to eight gigabyte per second, in turn allowing more bandwidth to chipset fed components. It also features a heavily upgraded Wi-Fi E standard, which apparently and presumably will be able to transfer data up to a mind-boggling 9.6 gigabit per second, but more on this later. All and for all, and despite some rumors, I personally believe that this will remain a PCIe 3.0 chipset, which has a double advantage of one, keeping it cool at about 6 watts of, of heat and cheaper to manufacture since we will not need um, an active cooling solution as seen on X570 powered motherboard. And frankly talking, it does make sense since it is a processor which will take care of all of the PCIe 4.0 heavy lifting. I did not expect anything else. Back to the memory. Our Strix Z590 eGaming can support up to 128 gigabyte of DDR4 RAM in a dual channel configuration overclockable to a whopping 5.333 megahertz. That 
is 533 megahertz more than its predecessor, the Strix Z490e Gaming. But note that despite having Optimum 3, the signal op optimization thingy of Asus, you are only going to be able to get to these higher clocks with a single RAM stick, meaning that if you're gonna uh, start populating the other uh, uh, memory slots, you're gonna find yourself with decreasing memory clocks. For example, if you go with four sticks, the best clock you can hope to achieve is about 3.6 or 3.8 gigahertz only. If you wanna go five and above gigahertz, you're gonna need those more expensive, higher density 32 uh, gigabyte RAM uh, sticks. That's how it is, unfortunately. Now, Staying in the memory, our Strix Z590e Gaming can support no less than four M.2 solid state drive, which is double the amount seen on its predecessor. But there is a catch. Coupled with a 10th generation processor, only three of them will be working at a PCIe 3.0 bandwidth, meaning data swaps up to 32 gigabit per second each. To have the four M.2 solid state drives working, you will need an 11th generation core CPU. And it doesn't stop there, because the two CPU fed M.2 solid set drives will then be swapping data at PCIe 4.0 bandwidth level, meaning data swaps up to a whopping 64 gigabit per second. An unprecedented and impressive storage upgrade coming from Asus here. In all cases, these sticks will get very hot very quickly, but thankfully Asus thought of that and equipped all of them with large and in one case, very long thermal padded heat sinks, which should not be much different from the ones we had seen on the ROG Maximus 12 Hero. Now I will note that having a single continuous heatsink for two M.2 solid state drive, even only running PCIe 3.0 levels is definitely a bet. I am not certain that if you populate both of those M.2 solid state drive, that long heatsink will have the thermal ratio to radiate enough heat fast enough uh, to avoid thermal throttling, something I will be definitely be focused on, laser focused, as soon as I have the board in hand. Export wise, we have three PCIe 16 slots and that's it. We have no single slot, single speeds, no bachelor uh, connectors, which is a first for me, at least in a very, very long time. And I'm not sure it's a great move coming from Asus here because I mean, it might definitely put some limitation to the expandability of your board, especially if you're a streamer and using an Elgato capture card. Back to our 16 slots, as usual, only the first one can deliver up to 16 full bus speed. In a dual GPU configuration, bandwidth is split into an 8x8 PCIe configuration, hence the metallic reinforcements. The last and naked 16 PCIe slot have been capped at 4 bus speed, not exactly GPU friendly. Now watch it, because the PCIe standard of those slots will vary and change depending on what processor you will be coupling with this motherboard. With the 10th generation core CPU, all of the PCIe exports will run at a PCIe 3.0 standard with 1 gigabyte per second bandwidth per PCIe lane. But couple the board with the incoming Rocket Lake S 11th generation core CPU and our two first PCIe slots will see their bandwidth double to 2 gigabyte per second per lane. Great, but useless since none of the current video cards on the market uh, manage to go beyond the PCIe 3.0 standard. They cannot bottleneck that just yet. So it will absolutely not translate in any kind of performance gain, either gaming or, or uh, workstation wise. It is great for future proofing and marketing, but that's it. Now let's quickly note the presence of our usual six SATA ports able to swap data to that slow but reliable six gigabit per second. Nothing new here. But more importantly, let's move on to our back I, which does feature a padded integrated backplate fully expected on such a premium board. And starting from the left, we have a 1.4 display port as well as a 2.0 HDMI output, allowing 4K at 60 frames per second gameplay, which is a good thing since our 11th generation uh, core processor would be feature featuring next generation integrated graphics as well. So yeah, a, a rather safe and good move coming from Asus here. We have both clear CMOS and flashback button, especially practical for CPU-less BIOS update, a couple of USB second generation, four USB third generation, and four USB 3.2 second generation, including two type C. And for the first time, a dual channel uh, type C plug, which will be able to transfer up to 20 gigabit 
per second. Now, I would not call this a game changer, but it is definitely one noticeable upgrade that the Z590 chipset brings to this new generation of motherboards. Next, we have two 2.5 gigabit per second surge protected LAN, which is also a noticeable upgrade. Uh, when compared to its predecessor, the Z490. And having two large bandwidth LAN does expand quite a bit the possibility or the bandwidth ability of this motherboard, especially when you're looking at um, streaming or even mass storage. And that I like very much. Next, we have that upgraded Wi-Fi E the Z590 chipset also brings, which promises bandwidth up to 9.6 gigabit. There's not so much about the actual speed. It might be lower than that, but still, that is several fold above. So yeah, definitely curious to see what it gives. Finally, and again a first, we have the brand new, never seen before ALC4080 codec from Realtek. Now, there's not much to read or to see online on this new codec since Realtek has not officially released it yet. It will probably hit the, the web in the next few days, but I do suspect that it will give a very similar sound range that its predecessor, the ALC1220, but with a noticeable addition of intelligent in and out noise cancellation abilities, which will do a lot to further improve uh, your streaming slash recording abilities. In short, great for content creators. All right, now front panel connector wise, well, nothing new here. We have our two USB front panel connectors, our USB 3 front panel connectors, and a 10 gigabit front panel connector type C totally expected at that price range. Cooling wise, we have no less than eight PWM fans placed in different locations of our board for easier access, two of which can support two dedicated water pumps. Obviously enough to operate and support the most eccentric dual custom water cooling system. But I do need to remark uh, the absence of hybrid support, which I do regret since it would have uh, definitely added or contributed to a bit more agility to this already very agile motherboard. Troubleshooting wise we have everything we would need for such a complex motherboard, meaning an easy debugger to get us through the main booting stages of our board, further refined by a QLED error screen. Finally, Asus being Asus and Strix being Strix, they had to turn this board into an RGB fest fashion statement. Starting with a massive RGB strip hinder behind our IO roof, another hidden under our first M.2 solid state drive heat shield, a rather discreet and good looking corner strip on our chipset at heat shield and no less than an unprecedented five RGB connectors, three of which are addressable. Now I do have to say that I'm not a fan of this fifth RGB connector, not only because it is probably over the top and totally useless, but it is absolutely awkwardly placed in the center of our motherboard, right in the path of our massive video card. It absolutely makes no sense. In short, if you ever wanted to catch some rainbow loving grizzlies, well, this board should do the trick. In conclusion, um, I do expect the Strix Z590 eGaming to cost about $350, $50 more than its previous iteration, the Z490 Strix Gaming E, whatever order I am saying this. Yeah, it makes sense because I, I expect those $50 to account for all the extra features which were not there previously because Asus needs to make some money, don't it? And truth is, there is quite a bit more than I expected. Usually until boards see small and marginal improvements generation to generation. That is why I usually do not advise people to upgrade from a generation to another, at least in Intel's case. But this year is extremely different. It is an overall on VRM side, feature side, everywhere. And yeah, um, I, I would definitely you know, wait to have the motherboard in hand before saying upgrade, upgrade, even if you're on a Z490 powered motherboard, but it really looks like it is worth the money. But there's also something I really like. The Strix is no longer only gaming focus. There is some features such as like the dual 2.5 gigabit LAN, dual type C, uh, increased bandwidth, which makes it very content creation friendly and that really changes a lot of things. Now my only real concern is stock as usual because the whole end of 2020 uh, up to now showed that the best and the most you know the sexiest components out there are just out of stock. You know, said, this, is, this is BS, not the sexiest. All of the components which have been released in 2020 up to now have zero stock or almost it's just absolutely crazy. 
and I don't want to be teased or you to be teased by reviewers or select owners uh, to show off their new games and toys that you cannot buy because they're nowhere to be found at a normal MSRP pricing. So I really, really hope that Asus and Intel will get their game together, pun intended, so that on the 27th of January, this motherboard and all of the Z590 uh, uh, powered motherboard will be available to the grand public so they can find their way where they should be in your build. So, so that is the very next thing we're gonna have to cover on the 27th of January. Mer, mer.